Welcome back, Dr. Mila Wolf here today, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching. Today, we're reviewing natural hypertrophy strain. We've had a back and forth online, but I'm not acting in bad faith. I'm gonna be reviewing his videos and seeing whether or not I agree with his technique from a sports science perspective for hypertrophy. Let's break it down. Hello YouTube, and welcome to my top 10 hypertrophy list. As you can tell, I have a pretty decent physique. I'm fairly big, so I think I have some good things to share with you guys. So Appeal to authority. Movements that stood the test of time. Here's your citation. You know. But that I wish I could go back in time and start doing earlier because they truly gave me a ton of gains. That lighting is very loyal. It's not that these lifts are the best for everyone, but I do think that for hypertrophy, they are top tier. In a sense, it's like training straight out the shed in here. They might actually give you a ton of results as well. In terms of the way the list is structured, it's quite simple. There are 10 lifts in there and are ranked in order of importance. So when I look at my physique today... So these are top game, 10 exercises okay, as recommended by natural hypertrophy. If I took it away from this list, it would result in me looking worse. So in a sense, as Bodom said himself, if I was stuck on an island... A quick caveat right here. You can't really determine causality, right? Like, there's a million things happening in your life right now that are more influential than which exercise you picked. Is the difference between a close grip bench press and a medium grip bench press really large enough to be able to detect within the context of your life, right? Could you really say you've grown your chest more over the past two months because you switched to close grip versus medium grip when your sleep, stress, nutrition, and other factors all change, as well as your volume, your frequency, so many influential variables are at play, the determining causality from your own training in terms of your results is actually a lot more challenging than people realize. Island with a gun to my head and I was told, okay, you can only do 10 movements. These are the 10 movements that I would do. At my number 10, I have French press. What a surprise that a Frenchman would have the French press in his list. I believe that it is a great movement for the long head of the tricep. Uh, I agree. I the French press is great. And it is the inclusion of the French press into my program that made me love training this body part. To me, most of my- This is great. I love it. Came from the French press. And I love to do them with a dumbbell. Now, the issue with the dumbbell is that you run the risk of developing tendonitis, which I've had. And when that happens, you're stuck. Ah! Because you cannot spam the movement. And a movement that is not spammable will not get you much gains. But I have found ways around it. So, for example, if you have a cable stack, the French press with the cable stack is S tier. It is the best way to do French press. You could I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that doing the French press with a dumbbell is going to cause more tendonitis than a cable or have you. Equally, I love the French press. I refer to it as the overhead extension, but it's the same thing. I think it's great. I think it lengthens the long head of the triceps more, which, as you can see in this video here, results in more hypertrophy. So overall, I agree. I don't agree with Tanai stuff, but who cares? Splitting hairs here. You could also, if you wanted, just shift or torso angle, so as to do the French press behind the head like this. With the shift, I find also that it makes it much more comfortable. It's a very simple barbaric movement, but if you have never tried it, I encourage you to do that. Now, for my number nine, I have Romanian deadlift. They were never a priority, and I regret it. Romanian deadlifts are great. I really short changed my gains, especially in the arm strength department, by focusing so much on deadlifts. There's a reason why many people nowadays say that the deadlift is... As much as we've had a back and forth about power building and deadlifts potentially not being optimal for growth, I do generally agree that RDLs are better for hypertrophy than straight up deadlifts, right? They will lengthen the hamstrings more. They will generally lengthen the glutes more. So... They are a better exercise for hypertrophy, especially when you consider that most people perform RDLs with an eccentric, whereas they perform conventional deadlifts without an eccentric. So I actually agree. If it's worthless for hypertrophy, I disagree with them, but I do agree that for bodybuilding, if you do 80% of your volume with deadlifts and 20% with the Romanian deadlifts, you're not doing things properly if your goal is hypertrophy. But I think that's fine. Deadlifts, because the if your primary goal is hypertrophy, you probably shouldn't be deadlifting. Or if your only goal is hypertrophy, rather. So the easiest way to make sure that this never happens is also to do deadlifts on the side. At this point, I do both, and I find that this is the best way to progress on the pattern. Number eight might be a surprise for some of you guys, because as you know, I was the no shoulder guy for a long time. But now I try to grow my shoulders and the lift that I use for that is the overhead press. That is at number eight. I think is this an overhead press or a Bradford press? Vertical pressing, you are shortchanging yourself. You really should be doing it. Lateral raises are a good addition, but they are not enough. So to me, they are vital. And this is why they made their way into that list, because any and every shoulder gains I've made in the past three or four months, I've made solely by spamming overhead press as much as possible. So this is my method, and this is why I think that you should do them as well. Now, so I think overhead press is a great exercise. I don't think it's a must include, right? Like he made it seem like it was a must. I don't think it's a must. I think you can get the same gains doing cable front raises, some ladder raises, and some rear delt work, right? I don't think they're essential, but I do think they're a great exercise. And I think if I were to construct a hypertrophy program, unless someone had a preference against it, or someone had pain doing overhead press, I would typically include it for hypertrophy. So again, I agree. Now what I would tell you for this is to find a style that you like. When I do an overhead press, my grip is here. It's within the shoulders because it's what's comfortable. Same for you, find the grip that you like the most. It could be a snap grip, it could be behind the head, it could be with dumbbells, it could be a neutral grip, I don't care. As long as your arm does this, 
you're good. Then for number seven, I agree. This is excellent. What I've been doing the longest, not quite. And it is dumbbell rows. I absolutely love dumbbell rows. So I would just bend over on top of two dumbbells and roll the two dumbbells at once doing something like this. And it grew my back. And not just my back, it also grew my posterior chain. Because guess what? This is the only exercise I did for posterior chain, the only one. And when I started deadlifting, I think it was two years afterwards, so two years of doing rows like this, the first time I deadlifted, I picked up 275 for five with good form. It wasn't really my first time deadlifting. Oh man. Doing. So I don't think and this isn't the this, but I don't think 275 for five is anything to be like impressed by. Like I've seen untrained people do that. So I don't think dumbbell rows necessarily cause them to be strong in the lift. But the dumbbell row is absolutely fine. Would I pick it as an exercise to try to get your whole posterior chain? No. And I think RDLs will do far more to grow your glutes and hamstrings and adductors than dumbbell rows ever will. But I think for the upper back and mid back, the dumbbell row is excellent, right? Like you're going to put on a lot of size. It's not the best exercise ever, right? It doesn't have the best resistance curve. Like most back exercises, it'll be hardest in that shortened position. And I think length and partials do circumvent a lot of that issue. And I think potentially, right, anecdotally, that's why people like cheating on rows is because they still get that lengthened position and they kind of are not limited by shortened position strength anymore. But I would say just do lengthened partials instead. Cheating will add more fatigue for not much additional benefit in this case versus doing like the partials. So I don't disagree with him. I think the dumbbell row is a fine pick. My arm strings, my glutes, and my lower back. Now that I'm more into bodybuilding and I want a more focused approach, I do them with only one arm by posting myself. I made a video about that. It will be in the pinned comment. If you know how to do your dumbbell rows properly, it is an amazing movement because you can feel every fiber of your upper back stretching. And this is one of these lifts where when I see people tell me that- I think it's good. Rows, my answer is you're not doing dumbbell rows properly or you haven't found your style yet. There are so many ways to do them that at this point- I do think for most people, dumbbell rows are slightly better than barbells, mostly because it's down to execution. Right, like when a lot of people do barbell rows, they will put the bar down at the bottom and not get that stretch. Whereas with dumbbell rows, most people do get a full stretch on each rep and thus get more hypertrophy, right? So that's a great option. I will say they might be a little bit less time efficient by having to do both sides and both sides actually being relatively tiring. Your session duration might increase a little bit versus doing bilateral dumbbell rows, right? Where you're not supported by a bench. You just bend over and do some rows with both arms at the same time. I think that's going to be a better option. The other, if you're not doing squats, or at least a heavy knee flexion, which is... Squats are great! You're not going to get big legs, or at least not as big as they could be, meaning that I don't buy into the idea that you could get massive legs from lunges and from knee extensions. I'm not a purist, I'm not saying... <sighs> Man... You can do low bar, you can do SSB, you can do hack squats, you can do belt squats, I do not care. But please, do your squats. For me, my legs are massive. Well, admittedly... I think his legs are fine, I wouldn't call it massive. Although, damn. Alright, Charlie. Um, I don't think you need to squat to maximize lower body size. I think with a split squat variation, with a lunge variation, with anything that allows you to get deep knee flexion and or deep hip flexion in your training, you'll be just fine. I think you get the same hypertrophy doing length press, leg press, sorry. I think you get the same hypertrophy doing leg press and RDLs and other exercises and skipping squatting altogether versus needing to do squats. So while I agree that squats are great, they're not a must do exercise. Within hypertrophy training, Nothing really is. Uh, not defined at all, not just massive hams, but all of that mass I got, I got from squats. I never did a leg extension. Nice legs, actually. I take it back. Until I had already 26 to 27 inches squats. My legs were already that big when I started implementing other methods. And I encourage you to also have at least one type of squat in your list. Now, for number five, we start to get into my favorite movements of all time that I do all the time and I've done for pretty much forever. Oh, man. I'm a curl bro. It should not be a surprise. I'm absolutely obsessed with biceps. To this day, if you look at my feet... The technique here is not great. That's for a reason. If it were to be that more and more people started... Oh, man. Obviously, for example, as they treat their compounds, you would see more and more people with massive arms. Actually, find your style of curl that you like and you will find that it will it will give you tremendous... Reason. First things first, the execution on that clip of curls is going to be far from ideal for hypertrophy. And that's based on... 20 to 25 studies now showing that more length in training, we actually get a stretch in the muscle group, is superior to, for hypertrophy to more shortened training. And so I would not recommend the technique he was using here. I think curls are great. I think you should do curls in your training. I don't think barbell curls are going to be the best option. I think typically cable curls allow for a better resistance curve, allow you to get a deeper stretch. Incline curls can be great, specifically when coupled with length and partials so as to actually make that bottom position challenging. I think it's fine. For what it's worth though, I don't think he has particularly outstanding biceps. I think his physique is reasonably well balanced. And I think people often fall victim to the idea that symmetry is this all elusive thing. Whereas if you actually speak to bodybuilding judges, if you actually compete in bodybuilding, 
you'd realize that at least within bodybuilding, symmetry is a lot more of a range than target. And like, you know, the whole spider physique thing is a bit silly to me. Results, as long as you do them properly, of course. Now for number four is a lift that shouldn't really be on the list because I only started doing them three years ago. But in three years, it made such a difference in my physique and it impressed me so much with the gains I got that if I'm not doing pullovers or doing something wrong. And I firmly believe that because- The I technique know, is a problem here. Which is the point of bodybuilding, of course, every lift does that, but there is something almost magical about pullovers. It's the technique here is a real problem. I think that the depth is, it's like if he was quarter squatting for hypertrophy, right? My bro, you can go a lot deeper than that. So for hypertrophy, go a lot deeper than that. As I mentioned earlier, length in training is better than short in training for hypertrophy. And the dumbbell pullover specifically is already designed to put the most tension in that length position and to allow you to get a stretch in your pecs and in your lats. So why wouldn't you just go deeper? The exercise is great. And I think as far as like, if I had to pick one exercise for the lats, I would probably pick the dumbbell pullover or the barbell pullover. But I think as far as the technique goes, once again, like with curls, I think it could be a lot better. Ribcage expansion. Until you experience it, you don't understand it. So I recommend that everyone try. I don't think there's anything to ribcage expansion. I think it's just your serratus anterior lats and pecs getting bigger. Go back in time but, and you know. force my younger self to do a lift, it would be pullovers. Because I firmly believe that if I started doing pullovers the first day I got dumbbells, my body would not look the way it looks now. My physique would be on another level. But that is not true for number three, because number three is actually the first lift that I ever started doing. And that is sit-ups. I was obsessed with sit-ups, like many young men. I wanted a six-pack. So every night, I remember, in my bedroom, I would put the radio on, and I would put my feet underneath the, the thing, la, la, l'espèce de, 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 de thing. He's speaking French now. Probably tonight for some reason. Moi aussi, je parle français, donc on est parti. I still have a six-pack to this day. Uh, I, again, it's an approach that is completely Damn. idiotic. Looking diced. And to me, if you are not doing a form or another of isolation for your abs, you are showcasing another type of stupidity, but one that you will actually regret. Because ab isolation is free, guys. Please do it. Right? I, I've seen many of these lists from many I agree. community, and I was saddened to not see I think ab isolation is a great idea. Just to go back to a time where bodybuilders were actually obsessed with abs, the shredded bras don't have the monopoly on ab development. We can take that back as well. For number two, I have pull-ups. So you'll see that number two... I agree. And in fact, I think that direct ab training is a little bit slept on, especially by people who are not that lean. Like, you can get bigger abs that will be more visually impressive, even at higher body fats, even in the off season, right? If you train your abs directly and grow them as a muscle, they will be visible and more impressive even at 15 or 20% body fat oftentimes for males. So do it if you want bigger abs. Number two, number three, number one are all in the same vein. These are movements that I've done forever. And I think they were the most instrumental in developing my physique. Pull-ups are still the king of upper back daughters, in my opinion. If you want bigger lats, do your pull-ups. If you want a better defined upper back area, do your pull-ups. If you cannot progress anymore because- you Again, the technique on these pull-ups is not great. Get a full stretch. Grip. There are so many ways to do pull-ups that you will always find a method or another to squeeze more gains out of them. My back, before I started doing pull-ups and after I started doing pull-ups is night and day. I used to have a fridge back where my back was like this. And when I started doing pull-ups finally, and I was out of my power... Pull-ups are great. I think that they don't have the best resistance curve ever, and I typically do prefer pull-downs for length and partials, but I think pull-ups are great. Rows, dumbbell rows, and pullovers, you're good. You got your upper back games covered, throw a hip hinge into the mix like an RDL, and you're going to have a massive pitbull back. And then we move on to the number one. Never heard the term pitbull back. That is not even really a lift, but to me, when I thought back and I, I questioned myself... Interestingly, I don't think RDLs really grow your upper back. I think they will grow your erectors, which do extend up your spine. So I guess technically they might grow your upper back a little bit, but I think that's a different type of growth than most people think. I don't think RDLs or deadlifts will really grow your lower traps or your mid traps or your rhomboids or anything like that. So just my two cents. Myself and I looked at my body and I was like, all right, look at what you look like. Which lift, if you took it away, would make all of this melt? And the answer was obvious to me, push-ups. Push-ups made the single biggest difference in my physique. I did hundreds of This is a hard take. Rest day. And the big mistake and the regret that I have with push-ups is that I turned my back on them because at some point I discovered bench press and I was like, well, so long push-ups, I found a better variation. You suck now. And I was- I think push-ups are great. Don't get me wrong. As long as you find- But I think using a deficit push-up where you get a deeper stretch in your triceps, front delts and chest will be a lot better. The traditional push-up, the way most people do it, is not that great. I feel them in my chest a ton. There is a reason why, if you follow my novice program, I have you do push-ups more often than I have you do bench. Because to me, this is the type of movement that is instrumental. People talk about building a base, building a base, and usually what they mean is, get a four-plate deadlift. That's not a base to me, that's bullshit. A base to me is getting proficient at push-ups, getting proficient at pull-ups. That's a solid base. If you get these two in orders, then- I don't think proficiency hugely impacts how much muscle growth you can get from an exercise. Right, like even when you're new to an exercise, these are all I'm not sure you need to be super proficient at it before you can grow muscle from it. So- Regardless of your level in bodybuilding, the biggest mistake you can make is turning your back on the basics. I see many bodybuilders do that and they're making a mistake. If you got most of your gains from something, never stop doing that thing. You can refine your approach and add other things on top of it, but never ever shun them because again, you will regret it. 
If you look at the movements, I would like you to also not focus necessarily on the variation I presented, but rather on the patterns. Every lift on this lift I think it's true. I think focusing on movement pattern versus the actual exercise is a lot more helpful. There will be small advantages between different you know, variations of that movement pattern, but by and large, they will save the same purpose. All of these are necessary, none of them are negotiable. People talk about the big three, the big five, fuck all of that. The bare minimum for a bodybuilding program is a big 10. It doesn't have to be these movements, but it has to be movements that target the muscles that that list covers. And that is going to conclude this video. Now, Bold Army Man told us to uh, actually select other people, all the lifters that we would like to hear from. I'm going to take things a little bit differently today. I would like to hear from my fellow Frenchmen, people that have- Well, that's the video. We actually agreed on a lot more than I thought. I think that by and large, with his emphasis of, you know, the pullover, you know, the overhead extension on the French press, as he called it. I think I agree with a lot of stuff. I think the technique was not as good as it might have been. I think the use of the term spider physique and other like political videos is a bit unnecessary. But I think that overall he's not terrible here. So I'd give him like an 8 out of 10. So solid. Fun fact, by the way, I do speak French. So even when he speaks French, I can understand him. That's the video. If you liked the video, please comment, like, subscribe, leave a comment down below and let me know who else you want to see me, PhD in sports science, react to. And I'll see you guys, my viewers, in that next one. Peace.